Welcome to the 3-0 Show, part of the Athletic Baseball Show. It is Thursday, April 20th. Derek Van Riper, Rich Roli, Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We will discuss the return of Fernando Tatis Jr. We have the Oakland A's signing a binding agreement to buy land in Las Vegas, which basically means the A's are moving to Las Vegas. So we'll talk about that and the fallout from that upcoming move. Max Scherzer ejected from a game this week for sweat and rosin. We'll dig into that. And we've got the Judge versus Otani series happening right now with the Yankees and Angels. And I think it's interesting that the the league seems to be marketing this series a bit differently than it's marketed regular season matchups between star players in the past. But we begin today with the return of Fernando Tatis Jr. It has been a roller coaster to begin his career since he debuted back in 2019. This is a guy that is as talented as anybody in the league. It's a PED suspension that he's coming back from, but he had shoulder surgery while he was gone. There were multiple motorcycle accidents in the time since we've last seen him play. There's a, a lot of things going on with Tatis that complicate this. I think the simple question to start is, what should we expect from him coming back from all of this? Do we expect Tatis to come back and be the superstar player that he was the last time we saw him on the field back in 2021? What do you think, Britt? He kind of has to be, guys. I mean, you look at the way the Padres have played, and they, he doesn't have a whole lot of runway. I mean, they've really struggled offensively. Yesterday, Juan Soto did have a home run. Um, he did look better at the play and a hit. Manny Machado just got robbed of a home run. He also had a hit. Um, those are the two big guns who haven't really been getting it done at all for San Diego. Xander Bogarts has really been kind of the only consistent guy in that lineup. I think in a perfect world, they ease to tease back in. But look, I mean – I've been reading the coverage. They've been talking about Tatis coming back for a long time, which is kind of what you hear when a team really needs some kind of boost. So he better deliver. Now you look at what he did in AAA and the, some of the exit velocities and stuff. I mean, he was hitting balls very hard. Obviously, the biggest jump in sports they always talk about is AAA to the big leagues. It's going to be uh, decidedly different. But I don't think we can sit here and wait for him to be eased in and have him have a, a, a slow first month. You know, I think there's already, I don't want to say panic, but some concern over what's going on in San Diego. And they really need to tease to, you know, lengthen the lineup, as manager Bob Melvin put it. He's going to, you know, hopefully take some of the pressure off some of those other guys who, you know, are, are definitely doing too much. I was talking to someone in that organization yesterday and they said, look, everyone's pressing. I mean, it's different to be the underdog, which is what San Diego has been in previous years. Now they're the hunted, right? It's a totally different situation. And I think just too many guys are going out there and trying to do too much. So they really need to tease. They need somebody to spark them. And he's a guy who's very capable of, of sparking a team. We were talking about him as one of the most dynamic players in baseball before this, this spiral, which by the way, was of his own making. I mean, nobody should feel bad for, um, this guy who really kind of dug himself into this hole. But now it's kind of ironic that he's going to be the one tasked with getting the Padres out of what's really been kind of an early season team-wide slump. Yeah, I think there's one other angle here that I want to throw over to you, you know, from a, like a projections and performance standpoint, how difficult is it to take someone who lost time due to a steroid suspension and injuries and reliably come up with something going forward that actually makes sense. Because what Britt was describing from that rehab assignment makes me think from a physical standpoint, he's as healthy as he's been in a couple of years. And if he's healthy, I think he could still be every bit the player he was before all of these things happened. But do you think that's a realistic expectation from a numbers perspective? I do. I think I heard of a 115 uh, max exit velocity on his stint in AAA. That would be right in line with where he was when he was healthy. And maybe the time off gave him what he needed in order to rest that wrist. The wrist was as problematic as the shoulder. And then, you know, when it comes to analysis of pre and post uh, steroid suspension things, you almost never find an effect which you could say, oh, maybe the steroids don't do as much as people say. Or you could say more cynically, you don't know when they started and when they stopped. So uh, I think just from a uh, from a from an analysis standpoint, um, I think he could come back and be just as good as he was before. And I agree with, with Britt. You know, the, the early season uh, swoon for the Padres offense has been significant. They are 
24th in runs, and uh, it's a little bit better if you park adjust. Uh, they're 21st in park adjusted offense. Still not where they wanted to be. And, you know, going into the season, they were projected to be one of the top two teams in the big leagues. They've fallen now, actually, to the sixth, still the second best team in uh, the National League pro in projections going forward. And I think part of that is adding Tatis to this offense that has been so far, you know, not so great. And uh, once you do do that, I think, you know, I think lengthening the lineup almost makes it sound like, well, you know, he's going to make us better at six, seven, and eight. But <laughs> it's really like at some point, Manny Machado is going to get going. At some point, I think Juan Soto is going to get going. And then you're going to say, wow, these guys are really good one through four. And then they have some guys that are okay, six, seven, and eight. I guess it's to sort of push everyone down a notch sort of thing. But I, I think this is a team that can bang with anyone once Tatis is healthy. And I think this will be kind of the spark they need to get going. Yeah, I think Bob Melvin uh, basically said, uh, without saying it, Jose Azokar is not Fernando Tatis Jr. So once Azokar <laughs> yeah. is playing less, once we replace the guy with the 59 WRC plus with the guy who has a 159 WRC plus, our lineup will be better, which is true. And it, Machado is going to hit. You're not. No one's worried about Manny Machado, uh, even after a 20 game slump. We can call it to begin this season. I, I think the, the the questions about this team will change i think if anything we're going to have more questions about the health and effectiveness of their pitching more they're going to have questions about the health and effectiveness of this core group of hitters this group of hitters will ultimately be fine uh, one more tatis factoid real quick i was just looking at the leaderboards since he came into the league in 2019 best hitters by wrc plus since 2019 not surprisingly mike trout number one kind of in his own tier 175 wrc plus Aaron Judge, 168 at number two. Jordan Alvarez at number three at 163. And you got Tatis tied at fourth with Juan Soto. So they have two of the five best players since 2019 in this lineup right now. And they're both so young that you really don't expect any sort of significant drop off from that elite level. I think that's from what a, makes this team so compelling. Yeah. From a soft skill standpoint, from a psychology standpoint, too, I could see this helping Juan Soto. You know, it's just another guy that everybody will be talking to. And all of a sudden, they're not asking you, Juan Soto, about the pitch clock or why aren't you slugging or this or that or, you know, bugging you about all that. So a little bit of attention away from Juan Soto and towards the kid, I think, could be beneficial for, for the veteran. Yeah. Here. Yeah, that's a good point. What's so interesting, guys, is that this Juan Soto, this version, I never saw covering the Nationals. Mm. I mean, he just... And and not just on the field production, obviously, but off the field, the guy who just really seems is in his head right now. That's the the four hundred forty million he turned down, or you know what he's doing offensively. But you're right, you know, I think some time or no one wants to talk to Juan Soto, where he's not the story, could really help Juan Soto, which he really wasn't supposed to be the story on this team anyway. Right. He's become the story because he hasn't played well. In a perfect world, Juan Soto you know, is not the story of the Padres, right? It's Manny Machado, it's Tatis, and then Soto. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I wonder, you know, comfort is a big deal, right? Like, he, yeah. he, the Nationals are the team that signed him. He came up through that organization. Yeah. At 16 years old, I don't think right. people realize, you know? So he was just um, a kid, and, and he grew up with them, and then he got thrust into a different situation, you know? Yeah, but an exciting return for an exciting player. If you're a Padres fan, if you're just a fan of baseball, even even with that PED suspension, I think Tatis is the kind of player that has so much time in front of him to maybe earn back some trust from a lot of people to show people, hey, look, I am a great player. I made a made a big mistake, but I'm a great player, and I can be I can be a, a face of a franchise because that was the trajectory he was on before this uh, spiral really got started. Let's talk about this uh, story that broke kind of overnight Wednesday. The A's have signed a binding agreement to buy land in Las Vegas, which means the A's are leaving Oakland. And uh, how exactly and when exactly they leave will still be determined here in the weeks and months ahead. And, you know, I know this has been a story you've followed closely for a little while now, since this is closer to home for you. Uh, this seems like it's been kind of a, in motion for a while, an inevitable sort of outcome where everything we heard about that Howard Terminal site was really just uh, an attempt to maybe leverage more from 
Las Vegas by the by the A's ownership group. And it's just so unfortunate because there's there's just strong disconnect between the fan base, the history of this franchise, and the current ownership and what their goals and intentions have been seemingly for the last decade. Yeah, I think the number that really matters here is the five hundred million in tax abatements that they will get from uh, Las Vegas, according to this deal, and basically the three hundred and fifty million that uh, Oakland was willing to get to part with. And uh, you know, people might say, "Oh, that's not actual money; it's it's tax from future." You know, it's a rebate from future taxes. Well, dude, there's opportunity cost. That's future taxes you won't get, so it's still money, right? And uh, and I think cynically you look at this and you say, yeah, they leveraged the two te- the two cities, uh, you know, against each other, and they got the five hundred million they want. That's basically money in their pocket. I wouldn't be surprised if they pulled the Jeffrey Luria, built the thing, moved to Vegas two years later, sell the team, because mm-hmm. you get a huge uh, increase in valuation when you have this new stadium. Your your franchise is worth more, and so you that's like the perfect time to sell, just like Jeffrey Luria did with the Marlins. But you know, I don't know if this is the best move for baseball. This is the one thing that bothers me is that when you look at the numbers, Vegas is immediately the smallest TV market in baseball now. Um, it is uh, one of the older uh, populations in terms of the, the 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 city itself. It is one of the smallest cities in baseball now. Um, and when I looked, it was a while back, it was not growing. It was growing a lot slower than like Raleigh, Durham, you know, yeah. that area. There were other cities that are growing more. Now that's changed a little bit post COVID, I think, because now that people can work from home, uh, Nevada is growing a little bit because of their income tax. Uh, they, they don't really have a state income taxes. So people have left California for Nevada and it is growing on some level. But um, I'm just not sure. This is a small market. And the, I think this depends on two things that I'm not sure about. One is, will they retain Oakland fans? That's important because if you have the smallest TV market, you want to have a toe somewhere else. So can you retain Oakland fans on TV while playing in Vegas? I'm not sure because there's a real bitterness here in Oakland mm-hmm. about them leaving. So I'm not sure about that bit. And the other bit is, will tourists fill the stadium? Because without tourists filling the stadium, it's just a small city with a small TV market. And they have a ton yeah. of tourists. But but is your dream vacation in Vegas include going to a baseball game? I don't know. Summer outdoor activities no. in Vegas are, are not the most fun in the yeah, middle of the adorable. summer, especially. So yeah, you're going to need a retractable roof. Yeah. What, you, I think you need to go really, really creative to make it. A fan, a fan experience that goes just beyond the team playing there. Like you have to make it a destination. The ballpark has to be amazing, but there's to be some other really interesting features about this. As for the A's fans, I mean, Britt, this is this is just a, a gutting move to take this team away from this franchise. Mark Currig wrote about this. He grew up in the East Bay, following this team, going to games at the Coliseum, and we all have strong connections to the teams we grew up with regardless of the sport, right? It's, it's personal for all of us. We, we, we have happy memories rooting for those teams when they win. We have uh, sad memories when they lose. We have other memories just being there with friends, family, whoever we enjoy these games with. And to, to have that just taken away, that means a lot. Like We have a sense of ownership of these teams, even though we literally own 0% of them. That's just the way I think most people are as fans. I think you, you just develop this, this strong connection because – these teams and these events are such a huge part of our lives. So to, to Eno's point, I don't think the A's fans are going with them to Las Vegas. I think they're going to lose a ton of fans. I think A's fans are going to either kind of walk away from baseball entirely because they're just bitter at what happened that the league allowed this to happen. Some of them are going to become Giants fans because they're the next closest team. Others are just going to find exciting players and other teams to latch on to in other markets. I don't think you're getting this passionate fan base anywhere near in its entirety kind of following this team along to Vegas and still being passionate, devout ace fans. Yeah. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the fan base largely already gave up on the team. I mean, there's photos out there of like 3000 fans at the stadium. And just like, I don't blame them to be fair. I mean, this is an organization that purposely drove its fans away, put a terrible quality product on the field to then say, well, we don't have the fan support. 
And that's ignoring all the golden years of A's baseball. And the fact that, you know, I went there for nine years when I was on the Orioles beat and he used to go there every year as an American League team. And that stadium got loud. Those fans were proud. Yeah, it wasn't the nicest stadium. Yeah, it was dated very quickly and for a good chunk of the time that the A's played there. But this is a classic case, I think, of an owner seeing an opportunity and really leveraging it. And the way they treated these fans, I don't know how you would want to spend your money going to see the Oakland A's, going to see that product of the Oakland A's, just based on how they were treated over the last couple of years. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that they're not going to follow them to Vegas. I also think the dangerous thing here is looking at the NFL and saying, well, they succeeded in Vegas. The NFL plays a small, tiny fraction of games compared to baseball. And NFL fans will travel to go see their team play in another city because it's fun and it's exciting. And again, they play once a week. You only get eight and you only get eight games at home anyway. So exactly. So you can get up there on a Friday. You can make a whole weekend of it, right? Baseball is different. You may get some tourist influx, but it's not enough in my mind to support 162 games, including half of that at home. So I'm going to be really interested to see what happens here because, you know, there were a lot better cities. I think Nashville much better suited obviously a different scenario across the country wants its own team um you know tampa bay is now going to be on the clock because oakland has seemingly figured this out they're gonna have to figure out tampa bay they've said before they add any more teams but honestly this is just sad i mean i have friends who are oakland ace fans who over the last couple years just kind of abandoned the team and i think when you look at this situation it may end up being a really bad fit in 10 years. If we're all still here podcasting, I hope we are on the three O show, a couple extra gray hairs, you know, we're like, wow, that was a bad idea. Who thought they could draw there, right? There's so many other things going on. I think baseball is not football. Certainly hockey has, has done well there because the team has done well. So there's going to also be a lot of pressure, not just on the stadium being cool, but the team out of the gate can't put forth this five to seven year rebuild. And right now, Anyone paying attention knows that Oakland isn't close to being good. They're not going to inherit a new team as well. This is the team. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to separate like where they are on the win cycle from like how good their fan base is behind that. You know, yeah. Like how good could this fan base be right now for a good team in this park? Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to see that right now. But you're, it's a good point. I they are not super well regarded in the rest of baseball for you know, their player development in particular. And so, you know, are they going to acquire a bunch of players? Uh, th- it's really exciting to have Mason Miller come out here and throw a hundred, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, your story Reeves looks okay, but that's, that's two players. And, yeah. you know, we're talking about four years from now. So are they even on that team? It, it's all going to come back to John Fisher turning a massive profit. I think exactly what was described a little earlier. I think this is going to be much like the Jeffrey Loria situation, getting a new stadium in a new market failing because it's a yeah. huge cash out, massive jump in value compared to what John Fisher paid. Probably going to sell this franchise for over $2 billion when it's all said and done. So, you know, if you want to, you want to be frustrated with any one person, John Fisher is a great place to start. Doesn't talk to anybody. doesn't do interviews. Doesn't explain anything. Uh, Dave Caval, I think, has been really the mouthpiece Mad of all Fred this. Was a, was also pretty pretty helpful for the A's in this. Yeah, you know, yeah, and I think I was to Vegas a lot, and it it that that's the thing. The league seemed like it wanted this to happen in some roundabout ways, or maybe some direct ways. That's I don't the know. Part I'm not sure is right. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure it's right. I'm not. I think a, yeah. a, a better team, a, a better stadium in Oakland would have been a better outcome for baseball. I think yeah. so too. I don't I think agree. Las Vegas is going to be a great market for Major League Baseball, but it's going to be a profitable one for John Fisher. So that's what matters here, I guess. I also realized that uh, a few years ago, back when Bud Selig was still commissioner, one of the previous times the A's were sold, when Lou Wolf bought the team, Lou Wolf got the team instead of Joe Lacob, who owns the Warriors and would have kept the team in Bay Area. Because Lou Wolf was a fraternity brother of Bud Selig. So if you want someone else to point the finger at, yet again, Bud Selig's fingerprints are on this. Who would have thought? Oh, Bud man. Selig is everywhere, ruining everything for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember him with the the the, the all-star tie game and just... Masson. Like I, I mean, his, his crowning achievement around here is the Masson oh, deal. Oh, the Masson which, deal. That's you know. <laughs> going to be in courts for 10 more years. What happens when the Nats play the Orioles like is happening this week? 
do they have separate broadcasts? Is it like Mass and yes. One, Mass and Two? You can choose they, everything. They used to combine the broadcasts, and fans hated it. That'd be like awkward. They used, yeah, it was like you know how people hate national broadcasts, right? Because um, they always think they're rooting for the other team that you're rooting for. Um, even though in reality, they're not rooting for either team, which is why home fans don't like it. Um, they used to have a combined booth and it went so poorly that now they have their own separate mass and one, mass and two. <laughs> <laughs> a combined broadcast would be so awkward. I mean, so much about watching your team is listening to the announcers that you like. I think yeah. even if your if your crew isn't the best in the league, you still have a strong attachment to them because they're there. Yeah. They're there every day for 162 yeah. games. They're the same voices you hear every single time you turn games on. So other people have pretty strong attachments there. Let's move on to Max Scherzer, who was ejected from a game for having sweat and rosin on his hands. His hands were too sticky. And it's been a strange week. This goes all the way back to, I believe it was Saturday. I was watching the Yankees-Twins game. Domingo Herman was getting checked out, and he was being told that he had to wash his hands. Herman didn't get ejected from that game. Rocco Baldelli, the Twins manager, did because he was starting to ask questions like, hey, what's, what are we doing here? Why are we, why are we letting him wash his hands? If there's a problem, there's a problem. So... It seems like just when I thought the sticky stuff was going to vanish and we weren't going to have these checks really find anything, we've had a couple in the span of like five days that have actually led to a good bit of drama. So what do we think here? You know, you're, you're the sticky stuff expert. Is, is this a, a breakdown in the system or is there more going on here than it appears? Well, it, there's, there's the player situation and there's a league situation. So the player situation is weird for me because uh, there was no discernible change in his spin rates. However, it's kind of like the Tatis thing where you're like, when did he start and when did he stop? <laughs> mm. So you can't you can't just look at baselines and be like, well, his spin was the same as it always was. Well, what was he always doing? You know, um, so that's that's tough. If there was something on his glove, it is technically against the rules even to have rosin somewhere other than the rosin bag so i think that i think he's headed for a 10 game suspension it's going to be about rosin but it's going to be about rosin the wrong place and in the wrong amounts that is not where i expected us to end up and (laughs) there was the fact that spin rate was going up league wide again and it was going back to where you know it almost was before enforcement began and then we did see with this new memo going out and these more you know stringent checks that spin rate did go back down so these uh, these like announcements they have they do have a, a league wide effect uh but when you look at each single thing that happens it doesn't make a lot of sense and so I just think it's super weird to uh, bang the first guy or the second guy ever to be banged for sicky stuff is going to get banged for rosin. Like, I I don't understand that. I think there needs to be some communication from Manfred to the fans because it's doesn't like this. Something doesn't make sense here. Yeah. I, so here's the thing that also gets me, guys. And in spring training, I remember this because um, – it seemed kind of random, but now it makes a lot more sense. So Gabe Kapler with the Giants was talking about how in spring training, the checks were not, you know, they were haphazard. It depended on who you got, right? What umpiring crew. Oh, and I this, think this umpire, right? Yeah. And so I think when you look at the fact that this umpire has been involved in all three of the, you know, the, the, the sticky situation ejections, you know, you do start to wonder, and, you know, I don't often agree with Scott Boris, but, you know, he did have a quote about how they need a little bit more than just one guy's opinion. They need to maybe streamline this so it's a little more scientific, right? And I do kind of agree with that because what is too sticky, right? I, I saw the quotes after <laughs> Phil Cousy said too sticky. Now, what's too sticky to him may not be too sticky to Obviously it's not, right? right? <laughs> because he's the right. only guy. <laughs> well, right. yeah, this, so, this is wild. I so didn't realize again, that this is the Bellino phil Cuzzy crew in both yes. instances, the Herman instance yes. and the Scherzer yeah. instance. Wow. So the problem is, and so again, I think back to that conversation with Gabe Kapler in March, which was only a month ago, but already seems like years ago. But anyway, I, I think back to how he said, you know, they need to have a more uniform police like policing system in place, you know? And he said that when he kind of brought it up, they were like, well, you're the manager. you got to police your own guys. And he's like, wait, like, that's a terrible idea to have managers try to police this. That's never going to work. You need the umpires to police it, but you need them to all be acting the exact same way. And clearly that's not happening here because 
Max Scherzer, if his spin rates didn't change, as Eno said, maybe he's been doing this the whole way through. He just ran into the umpire who's really into the degree of stickiness, right? Mm -hmm. And they made him wash his hands. They made him change his glove. They made him do all this stuff. The other issue I have with it is if Rosin is legal, why does he now getting a 10 game suspension? Because it's yeah. too, again, with the subject, sub, like just, right. you're giving the umpires all this power, but you're also giving them all this wiggle room, right? He said it was too sticky. So now he's going to get a 10 game suspension. So yeah. am I naive for thinking that if there was a substance on a player that they thought was too sticky, that they could maybe swab it and go figure out what it is and test it and see if there's more than sweat and rosin there? Well, can so we the, do that? Here's the yeah. thing. That's what I think. Here's the thing. Suspensions have to be from an on-field adjudication, ad, adjudication. You cannot do anything off-field. Like you can't take a swab and then the next day announce, oh, we tested the swab and he's getting suspended. Really? It, what about yes. a drug test? Mm, I think that's that's an exception, yes. But like when you're talking about breaking the rules, it has to come from something that an umpire did on the field. That's That's an agreement between baseball and the umpires. So couldn't they swab it and they have a designated guy who takes it into the back and in an inning, the results come up like kind of like a developing possibly, a picture. Possibly. Right? I don't, I, uh, I don't know how quick those tests are. Uh, I, I did hear one that was interesting. It's, it's a very low tech uh, solution, but uh, our friend, Dr. Meredith Wills, who's, uh, who's the ball, the ball inspector, ball inspector general. We should give her that title. <laughs> Although that, that sounds terrible. She has to sign uh, off on that title. Yeah, yeah, yeah baseball title. inspector yeah. general. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, she anyway. said, uh, why not have like um, a wiffle ball? And it, you take the wiffle ball and if it st stays stuck to the baseball mm -hmm. player's hand, that's too sticky. I mean, it sounds stupid, but it the is. thing is what we need is something like that. We need something that is a, an obvious threshold that yes. is meaningful and that can be tested super quickly, you know, well, not just yeah. I'm touching your hand. And like when we had the guy putting his hand through James Karinchak's hair and being like, and now what? That was weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the here's the question, though. What is to like, what is the threshold for too sticky? I guess has that never really been that's never really been put in print. Right. I haven't seen it. There's no. Yeah, this there's is nothing. too sticky. Yeah, right? You and could I think, do it with testing. Right. Like you could be but, like, oh, this pine. Like because we've seen with uh, spider tack, you can actually hold a major league ball yeah. to your finger with spider tack. So that's too sticky. And if you put sweat and rosin, you're not going to hold the ball to your finger with sweat and rosin. So already we have something there. But you could just do it with testing. We're like, okay, we're okay with plus 50 RPM. So that's that's this. So what is what does this stick to? Okay, it sticks to this and this and this. All right. So you could develop a test if you just went about it scientifically. So you don't think it was just sweat and rosin last night? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. And yeah, what I'm saying I, see, is... I, I, I would find it hard to believe after watching Scherzer's press conference that it wasn't just sweat and rosin. Now, I did cover him for a couple of years. He's a big pine tar guy, so he was upset when they got rid of the sticky stuff uh, because he couldn't use pine tar anymore because he prided himself on never having hit a guy in the head, you know, like never having <laughs> lost control for a pitch, which mm -hmm. is actually a more important thing to starters than you realize. Um, you know, that can really mess guys up. So my, my, kid, um, my kid just got hit in a game last night. We were at the hospital. He's OK. He's OK. Geez. But but yeah, I didn't when that know. happens, terrible segue. Like, uh, no, no, yeah, it's just yeah. it, no. You're right. The person but it who messes throws with guys. It is like it messes oh. with guys. So like it is. It's not. A, it's a source of like I don't want to say pride, but like it's something that like he doesn't want everyone to hit a guy in the head. He's never hit a guy in the head. That's an important thing. He thinks pine tar helps him in in the early cold months or on nights where he can't mm -hmm. grip. Right. So he was mad about the way that they're policing stuff because he wasn't a spider tech guy. He was a pine tar guy, but now so then he tried to find a legal way to, to, to so try to find a legal grip. way to, to do the sweat and the rosin. And now they're like, wait, that's too, this guy says it's too sticky. Right. I think major league baseball needs to like come up with some uniform thing of this is too, but then people are going to find all kinds of ways to lie. Like, Oh, also I was wearing sunblock. Am I going to get in trouble for that? Oh, it was my hair gel. I must've touched the hair gel on my head. Like just think about how easy are the loopholes you're creating now. But at so, least with a test, like the wiffle ball test, if that's what it was, you would just be like, this is the test. You fail right. the test. You're yeah, so if you happen to use it's a better third than like, oh, I think your hands are too sticky. Right. Because that's so subjective. Yeah. And it's, I mean, stickiness the, 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 is the hard union to measure has anyway. to file a grievance. Correct. I would. Automatically. 10 games. Yeah. 
hundred percent. Yeah. I, this is the problem I have with all of this too, is, is not that they're trying to enforce these rules. If they want to enforce these rules, that's fine. Here we are though, in the first month of this new exciting season where one of the 10 best pitchers in baseball is facing a 10 game suspension because of this seemingly arbitrary definition of what is sticky enough or too sticky. That's awful. That's terrible. Like why, why would major league baseball let that happen? If you're Rob Manfred and you're Morgan sword, make this process better and more transparent and easier to just get through because it shouldn't be the focal point. This should not be a thing that draws this much attention, but it becomes a a high attention story when Max Scherzer gets tossed in the third inning of a start for this. Yeah. I guess also what I don't understand is they made him wash his hands. Right. And he said he did it in front of an official and then he goes back out there and that wasn't, and uses the, the rosin again, but that still wasn't enough. So clearly it was just the rosin. So how do you stop that? I guess how do you tell they can use the rosin, you but they gave can't them use the it rosin. too much. Right. <laughs> they can use it, but they can't use it too much. I mean, I, I like the idea of, of having guys listen, wash their hands before the inning starts in front of an official, then go out to the mound. Then then it's really tough to cheat. Oh man, we could have a hand washing station. Official. Right, if someone like, could watch it, they could televise it. It could be sponsored I mean, by some soap company because you, you got to make money at every know opportunity. It's going to be presented by Dial. MLB does not miss those. Just like alcohol, alcohol swabs, like if they as they come out to pitch, you just psh, psh. yeah, just it swab just, it. And if you think his glove is like they did the right thing, they swapped out the gloves, right? But like Max was right, like he, you'd have to be an idiot, and let's all agree that Max Scherzer is many things. He's not an idiot to go back out there after changing your gloves and washing your hands to again put something else besides rosin on your hand. Right, because they're they're watching you. <laughs> you they're, really, know they're not, watching you. Yeah, it just makes no sense. So again, he used what they gave him, but he used it too well, and now he's going to get suspended. And the Mets really can't have him suspended. They're still missing Verlander. Carrasco's on the DL right now. They're their most like reliable starters. Kodai Senga, who guess what, is used to pitching in the six day rotation, and and literally his physical, if you guys remember, was quote iffy. <laughs> if I'm the Mets, I'm livid. So. That's another thing that needs further definition of physical iffy. Iffy. Uh, elaborate? What iffy? <laughs> what is iffy about the physical <laughs> exactly? The structure of the elbow, the structure of yeah. the shoulder. Was there something else? String that, holding yeah. these things together. Yeah. If I could be a fly on the wall anywhere, it wouldn't be like the GM's office. It would be like the training room because uh, there's all sorts of stuff goes on in there. All That's sorts true. of stuff. Oh, that could be. GM's text on you know? it, Ted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's been the kind of day where we've been um, a little more on the negative side. We we talk about the things that the game gives us. The, the Hayes leaving Oakland, that's a big mm-hmm. story. We have to talk about that. Shirts are getting tossed for sticky stuff that might have just been sweat and rosin. Big story. Got to talk about it. I noticed this has, has been very different throughout this week. The Yankees are playing the Angels, and it has been presented as Judge versus Otani. I even saw, I think, on MLB Network, they were pumping out some clips about who would you take between the two and doing all that kind of stuff? All, all the all the playful, friendly on social type stuff that for years it seemed like they didn't do well or at least didn't do enough. And marketing stars is really important for the game to continue growing the game, to get get eyes on the most exciting players. And I think they're they're capitalizing on Otani and Judge being at the absolute like peak interest levels right now. So this series couldn't have happened at a better time coming off of the World Baseball Classic. So do you think this is the sign of things to come. Is the league going to do this more going forward? Can they do this more going forward? Or is this limited to a very select group of players, Britt? Because you, you can't take any combination of two teams and pump up the best player on those two teams quite the same way that you can do it with Judge and Otani. Well, and they've gotten ridiculously lucky that both of those guys have had exciting series. I mean, Judge hits a home run and, and robs a home run, right? And then I think it was two days ago, Otani hits a home run in his first at bat. They're selling Otani gear at Yankee Stadium. Like, did you guys see this? Like multiple, like three or four different items with Otani's name on it. So I think this is kind of a special case where you actually can market both these guys. People want to hear about all these guys, both of these guys. Um, you're in a market that you know, there's a lot of eyeballs there. Interestingly enough, I think Otani is enjoying it. He took BP, which is not something he usually does. He get, he granted an interview on a day he didn't pitch. Not something he does. So I think this, as much as they want to try to replicate this, I don't think you know earmuffs, Derek. That you know the Brewers really they would be able to kind of 
<laughs> to kind of bring this kind of, of, you know, the Brewers Royals, right? You're just not getting that. You're, you're not going to be able to get that. But I think this is really good for the game. And another reason why I like the balanced schedules is you're getting some of these more exciting series and not just, oh, the AL East, we got to play in the entire month of April, right? I, I think you're going to see uh, some more exciting matchups than you wouldn't have otherwise. Well, hey, let's go back to that leaderboard for a second. I mentioned, you know, since 2019, the best hitters in baseball, Trout, Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Tati, Soto. Uh, if you lower the threshold for playing time enough, Trace Thompson, who's a part-time player for the Dodgers, is sixth in WRC Plus since 2019. That is incredible. That's for that's for a rates and barrels deep cut later on. Mm-hmm. Freddie Freeman, Bryce Harper, Paul Goldschmidt, Julio Rodriguez. That's your top 10. All of those players are the kinds of players that you can market this way if you choose to. And but could many... you do it with like 15 through 30? See, so you, you go down a little further, right? Then you get to Springer, Adley Rutschman, Alex Bregman, Vinny Pasquantino. I don't know. I think maybe you could pump up mm. Vinny Pasquantino versus Corbin Burns like as a, a fun matchup. Mm. But it's not the same as Judge versus Otani, right? It starts Regionally, you could pump yeah. it up. Yeah. Mookie Betts, Pete Alonzo, Kyle Tucker. It, it's close. Brandon Nimmo, Jose Altuve, Xander Bogart. That's your top 20. And then you got Vlad and Shohei Otani, Acuna. It kind of works. But see, I, I, what I think the problem is, it, it, it's not even a problem. Stardom in baseball, to some degree, I know we have numbers, we have war, we have production, we have things we can look at that, that kind of help us quantify it. Some of it's also manufactured, though. It, it's, like a, it's a mix, right? It's, you're, you have to be a certain level of, of good and productive, but the rest of it is just being pumped up to you know, be that star and to have some of those big moments. I think having a few big moments can sort of bridge the gap. If you're a top 25 player and you've had some huge moments in the postseason or hitting walk-offs that have been really important in the regular season or dominant performances, maybe you're a pitcher, you throw a no-hitter, different things like that can really kind of shape that narrative and kind of put you up onto that sort of pedestal. I just think it's really strange because I can't remember times during the regular season, especially in April, where the league took two individual players like this and just yeah. made a series about them. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it is that lack of regionality that is part of it, too. You know, uh, you're not going to sell uh, Sunday night baseball fans. Is it the Sunday night baseball? Is that why they're doing it? Is it? No, it's no, it was just a regular a series. A different series. Yeah, that was the first. That yeah. was the opening series of the week. Yeah, so I would have I, but it's that the it's schedule. Sunday night baseball where they pick they pick teams. So there's a little bit of a like we're focusing on, you know, Mets Giants or somebody somebody that we think two big markets. It's usually big market teams on Sunday night baseball. Yeah. But uh but in this case, maybe it is a lack of regionality too. How else are you gonna sell a Yankees uh Angels game, you know? I guess otherwise they would just ignore it. <laughs> wow, yes. yes. But like how many times have the Angels played that early in the season? The Yankees, mm. right? I think a lot of it is the schedule too. Um, I, I think it. Well, it, it goes team. back to, and maybe it's because Otani is a teammate of Mike Trout's, but I can't remember Mike Trout ever being presented this way. Yeah, right? right? I know That's he's. I know he's not a two-way not- player, but he's more like Aaron Judge. And the if you yeah. don't present him this way, people can't get. It's a chicken and egg thing. Is Trout yeah. the way he is? Is Paul Goldschmidt the way he is? Because the league and their respective teams didn't do a good enough job pumping them up for everybody. Or are they not pumped up for a certain reason because of their personality, their their inherent nature of just not necessarily wanting to be in the spotlight? I think it's the latter. I definitely think it's the latter. Having interviewed both those guys, I know. I, I think that way too. But it's <laughs> but as much as Otani is more of a, a jokester and a prankster and has more uh, obvious personality, um, you know, there is the language barrier. So it's not like yeah. um, we get. Uh, one-on-ones or you know like no. uh, you know we, we don't get the same look into his personality either so that's just like the, the question here to some extent is you know how much is marketing how much is the player himself right mm-hmm. how much is the money too right like people in japan japan is the number one baseball's the number one sport over Maybe there they're right? trying to get some ratings in another country or yeah exactly uh there there are these decisions that sometimes just get made from the top down um that are so strange. They had this whole like let the players play thing, you know, like the kids yeah, play. Let the kids play. Yeah. Right. And uh and then that just seems to go away. I don't know. Did like nothing nothing sort of came of that. And th- we had <laughs> we still had Bumgarner yelling at Wilson Contreras this year <laughs> this this week in baseball. So it's not like the baseball just all of a sudden decided to change and you know let the kids play. Uh, it takes time. 
um, but it's it's a step uh, it's a step toward a, a baseball future that I think we'd all like to see for the most part. I think most people want the exciting players to be as accessible as possible. So uh, I'm going to give them a, a small kudos. I think this is unique to Judge still being a Yankee and Otani being Otani. But I'm curious to see if they do it with more players going forward. I'd love to see for you know a big Astros uh, Mariner series, Jordan Alvarez and Julio Rodriguez getting the Manny same kind of attention. Manny versus Freddie, LA versus San Diego. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. So you can do it. You can do it with other matchups. So I, I hope it's a sign of things to come because I think – for one reason or another, I think that the casual fan, it tends to be very star focused, right? And also when you think about everything we were just talking about with ownership, taking the A's and moving them to Las Vegas and where our loyalties lie, I think the future is more people being loyal to individual players and saying, I want to watch these players at these times. I don't want to follow this particular team because, you know, players move a lot. <laughs> it's just the way, just the way the game has been for a long, long time. We are going to go on our way out the door. A quick reminder that you can get a subscription to The Athletic for a dollar a month for the first year at theathletic.com slash baseball show. You can find Britt on Twitter at Britt underscore Drolli. You can find Eno at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of The Athletic Baseball Show. We're back with you on Friday. Always got the green light here.